Welcome once again into the Radiopedia Reading Room, a podcast unconcerned with books or poetry, tea leaves or palmistry. It is but a humble radiology podcast. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me back lit in hues of purple and blue is my co-host, Frank Gaylard. Is this going to be another opening segment trope that you try and work in some little comment that I'm trying to work out how it fits in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I do. But purple and blue, is that just a Radiopedia reference? They're beautiful colours. They are beautiful colours. No, no, did you know? So Dan Fasher is one of the guests on today's episode. And in his 2022 Radiopedia uh, lecture, he said that purple and blue ambient lighting has been shown in testing to increase grayscale perception ah, I didn't did know you know that, that? yeah no. so you kind of if you backlight your computer screen onto the wall with with uh, purples and blues uh, you can perceive gray better apparently so i feel like subconsciously gaylord you knew this and so when you chose the radiopedia <laughs> color palette you were thinking of of trying to improve the efficiency of reporting rooms around the world no no i was just thinking of those muscle cars that have the leds underneath and the chrome oh, yeah. hubcaps oh really were you N- no <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> so there's no there's no reason for the purple and blues. I don't know how purple and blue came about, but I don't think it was a, a particular conscious choice. The early logo of Radiopedia was really colourful. Oh, yeah, I think I've seen that. Had all sorts of rainbow colours, and then when a designer who knew what they were doing, as opposed to me, looked at it, I think they uh, verped. A bit. Do you know what verb <laughs> means? It's like a vomit and a burp at the same time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> and they simplified it to uh, purple and blue, and uh, I think that's how it came about. <laughs> They've done a, a very good job. We we should come back and talk about um, lighting in reporting rooms another time mm-hmm. because it is something that comes up in this panel discussion as well, but very, very briefly. So today's episode, as I said, is a panel discussion. It's um, from Radiopedia 2022, and it's all about radiology reporting. So not just how you construct your written reports, but also how you optimize your reporting room environment, for example, uh, lighting and sound. So I want to get to that shortly, but first, uh, we do need some help with next week's episode. You'll remember, Frank, it's going to be a guestless episode, just you and me testing out some interview questions on each other. So we're wanting to develop this set of interesting get-to-know-you type questions with a radiology bent that we can then use in future episodes when we interview our guests. Is guestless the, the term we're going for? I don't know. Because I thought we were, had agreed on hostful. Well, okay, we can do hostful if it's, a, <laughs> it's an episode full of hosts, just the two of us. Like guestless makes it sound like we're missing out on something. Hostful sounds exciting, doesn't it? All right, we'll make it hostful. So next episode is going to be a hostful episode, <laughs> just just half an hour of Frank and me talking to you about uh, answering some questions and trying to decide upon some awesome questions for the future. And a lot of meat-related news. Oh, gosh. Uh, if you need a reference for that, back to the previous episode where Frank spoke about meat for like 10 minutes. So if you have any questions, please do send them in to podcast at radiopedia.org and we'll road test them next week. Okay, let's get into this week's episode. So this is a discussion hosted by Vikas Shah, who's an abdominal radiologist and Radiopedia managing editor. He's from Leicester. It also involves Paul McCubrey, a radiologist from Southmead Hospital. He's the author of The Rules of Radiology. You may have seen those. And Daniel Fasher, who's an MSK radiologist based in Yorkshire, who I think identifies as a radiology tech geek. Uh, he's probably he's probably a long lost twin of yours, I think, Frank. <laughs> uh, so this was recorded straight after Dan had just given a lecture entitled "Technology to Enhance Your Reporting Setup," and Paul's uh, lecture, "The Rules of Radiology Reporting." Both can be found in our so called miscellaneous lecture collection on the website, which is full of lots of kind of non clinical radiology lectures. So go and check those out. I'll hit play now, and then Frank and I will be back at the end for a chat. So I'm now joined by the two speakers from those talks, Daniel Fascher and Paul McCubrey. Lots of talking points I want to get into. Firstly, I want to ask you, Dan, you know, Paul talked in his uh, lecture about text in the reports and how to optimize it so the clinicians can make the best of it. 
but I've seen reports where people are taking it to another dimension, so adding in images, annotated images, and also videos into the report. So what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting prospect. And I have also had a look at some of the newer tools to create video um, reports. You know, I think we've had images attachable for some time now, haven't we, in the form of things like the classic key image that you might use in um, a meeting, but also um, rich reports like PDF reports where you can attach images. But video really is the new one. Now, I do have a slight concern over the time that it may take to record videos, because anybody who's who's tried creating video and editing it, it's quite uh, hard work. Yeah. Um, and, you know, skills at presenting and making sure that it fits for the audience. So if that's for a patient, then it's going to have to be delivered and presented quite differently to if it was for a clinician. And the clinician may not have the time to watch a video. My final and biggest concern is that I'm not really aware of many downstream systems such as EMRs or result portals, which can yet handle and display a video report. So I think there's probably a bit of an integration gap. And, and, and at this stage, it may be something of a gimmick. Just there, you mentioned the idea of reports being pitched at patients. So, you know, whether that video report is directed to the patient. And I wanted to ask you, Paul, your talk was geared very much at how to optimize your report for a clinician. But we have seen, maybe not so much where the three of us work in the NHS, but in other parts of the world, the idea that reports should be written specifically and crafted specifically for patients to understand. Have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I have. Thanks, Vikas. Um, I think it's it's very clear that if you are crafting your reports for specific clinicians, so specialists or, or generalists or general practitioners, then you do them differently depending on your audience. Um, I don't see how you can do a good report for your clinician and a good report for the patient because they're going to be completely different. So I... I don't have any experience in doing it for patients. I've got lots of experience of talking to patients about their scans, but not of, 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 of fashioning reports. For them. I think it will be a completely separate skill. And I think it would have to be done quite differently and separately um, to do it well. Otherwise, you don't get a patient happy, you don't make a clinician happy. I don't see how it can work. Patients, even in our system in the United Kingdom, in some areas can access their reports, can't they? Dan, I remember you telling me once something happened to you along this line. Yeah, that's right. I mean, certainly in my area, we are able to look at our own imaging reports on the NHS app. And I had an MRI scan and was able to look up the report and see that my friend had authored it and see all of his uh, comments in there. And I think it was a, a moment of realisation that that was how it functioned. And you had to therefore be aware of the, the fact that the consumer was not just the professional uh, market, but also um, the patient and um, of the ramifications that that could have if they perhaps didn't like what you'd written or even misinterpreted something which was perfectly professional. Yeah. And I think this is really important. Something I try to get across to my trainees that sometimes I've seen that they take out their frustration on the clinicians, perhaps not giving them the best clinical information in the reports. But we have to remember that patients can access these reports and we've mm -hmm. got to be careful how we phrase things and, you know, not venting in the report. That's really not the space uh, for that because that's actually a document that belongs to that patient's medical record. It's not the space for us to vent our frustrations at the clinicians. Paul, another thing you talked about was this three part human factor model, right? So the individual, the physical and the organizational all coming together to form these three circles. And within that lies a sweet spot where the really great work gets done. And Dan, you're at the interface of clinical leadership and also, you know, technological advancements. So I want to ask you, a lot of the reporting rooms that I've seen in different departments aren't specifically designed with radiologists in mind. They're just very generic hospital rooms that any specialty could use. So how can radiologists ensure that the 
departments are you know of the future are designed to cater for their specific needs with regards to all of these technological and physical needs that optimize our reporting i think it's a good question and i i think that the radiologists themselves should be a group force who demand good working environments and that their clinical directors and leaders should back them up and fly that flag to hospital planning estate departments uh, and at the executive level but there's definitely a role for guidelines here and one of my roles which you've hinted at is with the royal college of radiologists uh, where we've authored guidelines on what a reporting environment should look like and not only does it describe the workstation as a unit so you know the, the computer and its and its uh, assistive components but also the environment around so things like the ambience of the lighting the nature and color of the backlighting but also noise and distraction levels um, all things which have an impact on the way that we work and ultimately the quality of the reports we produce if I could just add in there, I think yeah. radiologists have a role in departmental redesigns or rebuilds. Um, and if you don't get involved when this is happening, then you don't get a say. So, yeah. you know, if something is in the offing, a new design, new build, you need to be all over it. And you really need to be uh, focused on the individual design of the rooms, the bits between the rooms, how they all connect, even things like sound insulation. I mean, a bit like when there's a new PAX being procured, then you would expect radiologists to be right there at the front of the queue in thinking about which features they want and, and picking them. And I guess there should be there should be no different. Absolutely. Now, that phrase, clinical correlation advised. Um, I know you don't like it, Paul. I, I'm not a big fan. I don't use it and I raise it where I can for my trainees reports. But I do understand why it's used and where it's coming from. There's this sort of sense that you want to ask a question, you want to ask a clinician to do something on the basis of your report. So how can that be better conveyed? So the reason that I say you got to get rid of it is just because, because it's so overused um, and gratuitously so by some people that it's become a stick to beaters. It's become this sort of jokey meme. That type of phrase has a role, certainly. So, but it's about making it work so for example if you're looking at a, an x-ray and it says you know hand pain and you've got a bit of soft tissue swelling somewhere and you go well is this the site of symptoms or if you've got lumbar spine that you you know talking about and you know back pain um and you've got a you know a slightly iffy sort of disc and a bit of maybe a l5 nerve root and you say is you know a, a, a symptoms consistent with l5 nerve root compression for example so i think making it a targeted question rather than a clinical correlation advised is is, is the way forward personally dan with your sort of very tech kind of hat on one of the things that we've talked about um, in the report, so Paul mentioned about how grading of osteoarthritis can happen. Um, so you can describe the specific features and you can then translate to that a to a grade and using a published system, of course. So is there a role for uh, mining the text of the reports to use artificial intelligence or machine learning to extract the relevant data to then output severities of certain diseases um i guess that's natural language processing is that correct is that the is that how that's done i suppose that is one approach to it is to look at the text but you are rather depending on the observational skills um and the report authoring skills of the radiologist hmm. if we're looking at ai then why not look at the image interpretation powers of ai for pattern recognition and, and actually, in some of these fairly mundane grading systems is where it would excel. And the example you've given me of osteoarthritis mm. is a prime example, something which, frankly, we find quite tedious as humans, you know, to, to look at a knee and judge each of the three compartments on how bad the arthritis is, is very tedious when you've got a batch of them. Yet for a machine, it's something that's highly repeatable. So I think I'd push AI towards the actual grading elements of it perceptually, rather than relying on passing our words and turning them into a grade. Is there is there any role for any kind of software to 
analyze the reports that we have to produce any sort of meaningful output? I think I think there are great opportunities for natural language uh, processing. Interesting fact, the first uh, NLP I ever did was 22 years ago uh, as a, a very fledgling yeah. uh, doctor. And it took the computer all night to, to process the batch of reports and produce a CSV file of it in the morning. And if I messed up on my pattern matches, I had to look at it again the next day. But now, of course, it can happen in real time as we yeah. hit verify or even as we're reporting. So I think with that in mind, it has the there are the opportunities to do super powered spell checking, you know, with understanding of yeah. that doesn't quite add up what you said. You know, you're talking right, then you're on left. Is that correct? Or have you messed up there? And then there's the opportunity for it to find trigger phrases which show severity of findings and offer you the opportunity to trigger critical alerts as well as potentially passing old reports and making sure that you are checking the relevant things for comparison in the current report, perhaps especially uh, useful in more in your world where you, you look at lots of um, GI cancers. Paul may have some ideas as well on, on that one. He's the sort of thing he would think about, I think. When everyone ever talks about VR, AI, and all this kind of thing, I always think, you know, natural language, and, and I'm, it, to me, it's fascinating and great. Uh, the more help I can get producing good reports, bring it on. All I just want is voice recognition that works now, please. <laughs> and, uh, you know, evidence would say that across the UK and therefore I'm assuming across the world, everyone has the same problem. So, you know, I don't I don't want AI tomorrow. I want VR now. Is it is it something we can t talk on for a moment, Vikas? Because I, I think in, in my talk, I perhaps didn't definitely reference the you know the, the poor recognition of VR and correlate it with technology, but there's definitely an element where people blame the software all the time. And it could well be the hardware setup that's going on that is not giving the VR a fighting chance of working or indeed the noisy environment. So um, microphones, we, we all depend a lot on that stick mic that we hold in the hand, but it actually has a really poor microphone if you go and benchmark it against the things that we're using right now, for example. Um, and then there's things like the position of the mic. So where are you holding it versus a boom mic, which is you know right there and gets your voice and not much else. Various devices like air conditioning and fans that have sort of flutter type noises um, can really throw it off. And I think you can fix a huge uh, number of the problems with, with those factors rather than the software. One of the things you mentioned in your talk, Paul, was this idea of avoiding hedging, sitting too much on the fence and getting rid of phrases such as cannot exclude. But on the other hand, you know, we have a duty to convey the sensitivity of the tests and to ensure that clinicians know that tests cannot diagnose everything with the same accuracy. So a classic example is looking for colorectal cancer on an unprepared CT, unprepared meaning no bowel preparation and no gas insufflation. So not a CT colonogram as such, just a standard CT. So how how can we convey that to clinicians without, without inflating our reports with multiple riders saying, you know, we can't exclude this and the test has a sensitivity for this? How can we do that? My personal take on this is that if you put a rider on every report, it'll just get ignored. Some people I know with their CT colon reports always put the anorectal junction has not been um, analysed and I presume you've done a digital rectal examination. Other people put more riders on than that. My personal thing is that it, your rider is is there if they've asked either a question of the, for the wrong test or where you've got a known deficiency in a particular test that they might, might not have thought of. Mm. So everyone puts rule out and exclude, and they don't really mean that, and they don't think that we are 100% accurate with everything. It's just a, a trend and, and, and one we have to ride with. But if, for example, someone's asking for you know, a, a scaphoid injury and you've got a normal X-ray, then hopefully there's a protocol in place if the x-ray is normal the person then goes on has an mri or whatever um whereas if there isn't that kind of thing you've got a gp uh, doing a lumbar spine film saying are the metastases 
mm-hmm. then clearly it's, it's the wrong it's the wrong test to do. And I then at that point would put a caveat saying, of course, plain radiographs are insensitive for metastatic disease, and if there are red flag symptoms, consider cross sectional imaging. And I'd do the same um, for abdominal X-rays for kidney stones. Uh, I'd do the same for CT for gallstones and things where we know we're not very good. And in some tests where you know when figures have been stated for the sensitivity of that test, then there's nothing wrong with, I think, quoting that. So if you're doing extended bowel prep rather than actually a formal CT colon, the, the papers in that say about 80, 80% sensitive, 80% accurate for bowel cancer. And so I see there's nothing wrong with where, where you know you've got something, you can state that. But I, I really do reserve this for not for routine, for yeah. tests where the clinician has asked either the wrong question or asked for the wrong test. Similar to what you said about the clinical correlation advice, which is it's not just saying cancer cannot be excluded and leaving it that. It's actually providing adding some value to the clinician and totally. saying and saying very gently, I know this is what you're asking. I can't tell you that. I can't give the answer on this test, but what I suggest is that you should think about this other test, which which hopefully they'll then find useful rather than just saying, well, I can't exclude what you're asking me to exclude. I think that's the key difference because it's that element of, of being helpful and adding the advisory. And yeah. for me, the great example was the, the scaphoid injury instead of instead of sort of rolling your eyes and going, mm, can't see anything. Yeah. It's to, to say and and, and, and we have a, a regional protocol or something which acknowledges the limitations of that test and we use a limited MR as the next one yeah. to be considered something, you know. Yeah. Uh, you probably both have a set of standard phrases for certain situations mm. that have been crafted to capture this. And, and for me, I have one for scaphoid, for the occult hip and pelvic fractures and the list frank injury the three that spring to mind in the msk world yeah 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 so similarly so i have some specifically for abdominal reporting for when we're looking for colon cancers uh, i'm sure paul who's an abdominal radiologist like myself will will have similarly but like we've all emphasized the important aspect here is to make it useful for the clinicians rather than them have to then contact you and say well you've said you can't exclude this so what what should I be doing? You can just preempt that by placing a very helpful yeah. statement in the report. But also think of it that exact way, because we are talking productivity as part of this session. Yes. And actually, if you produce something that for someone in your department, be it you or another, creates the, the work of communication and you know reply, it's all wasted time, isn't it, when you yeah. could have provided that up front? Yeah, you could have cut out that extra step, right? Mm. Um, In your talk, Dan, you talk about all these fantastic upgrades that we can all make ourselves, many of them ourselves, to improve the efficiency of reporting, to smoothen our workflow. But you also mentioned at the very beginning how it's this is all about safety as well. It's not just for fun, because I think sometimes it does get forgotten by non-radiologists, I must say, that the work environment is critical for safety because you know, the lighting, the, the noise levels, the temperature, um, how comfortable the chair is, how clean the desk is, these all contribute to your your well-being and your zen state of mind, if you like. And and a happy radiologist, I think, produces better reports and is therefore safer. Yeah, well, firstly, let me say I'm, I'm glad that you picked up that I tried in the talk to pick up on a lot of things that you can do yourself. They're either free or they're inexpensive. But your department should support you and invest in you by getting you these small upgrades like a, a better mouse or keyboard, accessory keypad, good lighting. And that's because there is more to it than a bit of fun. It's yeah. it's shown in the studies that I showed in an early slide that they have an impact on physical health, usually musculoskeletal health, things like repetitive strain injury, um, early osteoarthritis in your fingers, but also, and perhaps more importantly, in mental health, fatigue, and how you function in the workplace, how you interact with your colleagues and clinicians, and um, your concentration levels, uh, and the knock-on effect to the quality of the report output you produce. So it is serious stuff. Absolutely. It, I think all the, the, the tips that you provide in your talk, uh, I would take away saying, you know, this is all about, first and foremost, if I apply these, making me a safer 
radiologist, but secondarily then making me more efficient. And both of those will combine to make me a little bit more comfortable with my with my work. I'd add in two things there. Firstly, yes, it's about um, making your work slick. And the productivity thing is not necessarily about working faster, but just working slicker. It's, a, it's about doing, you know, the same amount of work, but with less effort. So removing all the obstacles. And that, and that I think, is the, the goal of productivity rather than to make you work faster as such. Second thing I'd add is that if you think ergonomics are expensive, try sick pay. And if you get somebody with a knackered index finger or a bad back or sore neck or whatever it is that's triggered by poor posture and, uh, you know, I've had shoulder impingement, I've had steroids in my shoulder, went with bad desks before now. And it's, 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 it's a real, real issue. And, you know, if somebody's off work, even for a month, that pays for every single radiologist to have a brand new mouse keyboard and backlighting and everything because of the, how much it costs to employ a radiologist for a month. So yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's a no brainer as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, absolutely. Take some, sometimes a bit of persuasion and convincing of management to, to for them to see this right because it it's the kind of quickest thing is to work on paying for reporting and you know because that's that's a that's what the headline figures are all about um the kpis right how many reports are, are left to be done but you're absolutely right actually it's paying for the long term isn't it yeah um, of all these tips that we've picked up from you both, I think one of one of the ones I use regularly is cleaning the screen, the reporting screen, especially in the common reporting rooms, you know, where you share the reporting workstations. I remember Dan and I used to work with a professor who'd come in every morning and the first thing you do was go around cleaning every single screen with a window cleaner spray because obviously it's non-smearing and then suddenly yeah. everything just looks clearer you, you suddenly stop seeing all those ground glass opacities and everyone's lungs are, are much <laughs> it took clearer. a boss to do that didn't it because yeah so but he's passed it top on to chap me. in the department yeah <laughs> and I've, I've i've taken on that habit um <laughs> and dan you know that that gadget that you've created with the hotkey buttons i mean that's really neat and i know both of you are real coffee aficionados right i mean proper coffee aficionados both of you have you managed to connect up one of those buttons and hotkey it to, to you know to make some coffee for you. Well, I think I'm I think I'm hearing that idea for the first time, and what a great <laughs> idea! And um, perhaps it could act as a little reward that every time I achieved say twenty reports, that uh, yeah. it would automatically brew me a, a nice fresh strong espresso. It'd yeah. be like a skinnerian rat, you know, when, when you <laughs> you know you give you another pellet of food when you, <laughs> you finish a reporting list. Pavlov in action. <laughs> Ringing a bell. Pavlovian radiology. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, both of you, for joining me for this really excellent discussion. Now, I want you to both to stick around because next we've got an encore talk by Natalie Yang. Uh, Natalie is going to talk to us about why every radiologist should learn pathology. And, you know, simply put, this is just another way to upgrade your reporting. And then I'll see you again here after that. There you go. Thank you, Vikas Shah, for that discussion. I've seen Vikas described on Twitter, Frank, as the smoothest voice in radiology. So uh, I think we might need to make him a bit of a regular on the podcast. Yes, it's like having your ears gently massaged with Vaseline. <laughs> He's going to love that, that we've mentioned that. So plenty of great stuff in that uh, discussion from Paul so and much. Dan. Listening to that part, about you know cannot exclude i was very much reminded of that um i don't know if you saw it this ajr paper i think it was michael davenport from michigan where they looked at something like twenty five thousand patients with ct brains and found that if the radiologist mentioned mri in the impression so for example something like you know mri would be more sensitive for detecting blah 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 that actually doubled the odds that an mri would be performed within 72 hours without actually having an effect on patient outcome. Oh, that's really interesting. Not surprising at all. When you dig into the paper, I think it was about, it seemed like 50% of reports mentioned MRI in them, which seems absurdly high. Um, I don't think ours would be anywhere near that here, but it just shows you the importance of the words, right? Yeah, with that particular example, there's really great difference between how different institutions report. At Royal Melbourne, 
it would be very unusual to add MRI at the end of a CT report unless you genuinely wanted them to perform it or the question required an MR for clarification. Uh, whereas some external reports have pro formats where at the end of every single CT, it's included in there. And you wonder about the incentives behind it, whether on one side is it a, a fear of litigation that there was something that you know could be seen on MR that wasn't appreciated on CT, or is it wanting to get extra referrals if you're reporting in... I don't know what the incentives are, but it does seem like not only pointless, but actually harmful because not only mm. is there an enormous cost involved to the medical system, to the patients, but there's also a cost to society generally with people having to take time off work. Often it's relatives of the patient have to take a whole day off work to be a carer, to drive their mum or dad to the MR, and occasionally people have contrast reactions or they have a pacemaker or, or whatever. Uh, it's so unnecessary. And these yeah. kind of studies, I don't think we do enough of them to show not just how good radiology is, but show where it is unnecessary and where we're doing too much. Yeah. And in that example there, I think you, you don't think as the radiologist, you recommend the MRI, you actually know it's going to take you a minute to report, right? Because the CT brain was normal, but you forget about all those other steps. Yeah. The patient has to be brought in by a relative, the amount of time on the actual scanner, contrast reactions, et cetera. Um, so I think it's important to not just think how much work it's going to create for yourself, which literally like a minute's work maybe to exclude dural venous sinus thrombosis, but to think about the overall system and how that works. I think generally that's something that's overlooked in medicine overall. And in a, in a medical practice that is fearful of litigation, it generates an enormous amount of unnecessary work where the harm probably outdoes the good that a lot of these practices create. There were so many things in that panel discussion that we could talk about, and I'm sure we'll talk about them in, in future episodes. But that idea of the radiology report being written for a patient to be able to understand, I, I reckon that is now largely solved with chat GPT, to be honest. <laughs> If you plug a complex CT chest or an MRI brain report in there and ask it to write an understandable version for a non-medical person, it, it does an amazingly good job. In, in fact, it's, it's probably better than me in most ways. So I definitely think you know, we should just continue to pitch our reports at clinicians and leave maybe AI to detechnicalize the report for, for patients in the future. What do you think of that, Frank? Oh, I haven't tried that. Sounds like a really good use of it. I think the level at which you pitch a report is is challenging even if you don't consider patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I, I don't think our role is to communicate to patients directly, but we need to be aware that patients do read our reports. So there are all sorts of terminology that can cause so much anxiety or worry in patients that can easily be avoided. For example, if you feel compelled to mention a pineal cyst, you almost never should because they're almost never big enough. But if they're over 10 millimeters, say, you might feel that you have to mention it. To say in the same breath, a common incidental finding of dubious mm -hmm. clinical significance is really helpful to avoid patients going down a rabbit hole of, of forums and ending up ascribing all kinds of symptoms to these. And we see that with pineal cysts. We see it with Tarlov cysts. Uh, we see it with Chiari. But even not thinking about that, like how do you pitch your report depending on who your audience is? Your audience isn't necessarily the person who's requested the scan because that report goes into your medical record. It goes to the GP, to the subspecialist referral clinician that's down the track. So it, it can be challenging. Do you consider very much when you're creating a report uh, who it is that's going to read it or do you just create reports on their merits? No, not often. I like that that comment that you are writing it for a clinician, but in the back of your mind, you need to know that a patient may read it. I think that's a good way of kind of looking at it and thinking about it. And I think Vic has mentioned it in the chat, that idea that you don't want to vent in the report because- oh, that's so important. You yes. might be venting to the person who requested it, got nothing to do with necessarily the person who's reading it. Uh, and if you've got the, the general practitioner reading this report and it sounds like you're giving them SAS, that's absolutely not what you want. So I thought that was a really good, good point. The one thing I do do is uh, for spine MRI, 
where I have a bunch of templates uh, based on a study. Uh, I don't remember the reference now, but that looked at the prevalence of various degenerative changes on MRI of the lumbar spine in asymptomatic individuals of different age groups. And I have three little templates for under 40, 40 to 60 and over 60 years of age that when a spine comes from not an orthopedic surgeon or not a neurosurgeon, I put at the end because it includes things like, just so you know, 60% of patients over the age of 60 will have disc desiccation and annular fissures and facet joint degenerative change in the absence of symptoms. We report these because they're abnormal, but that doesn't mean that they're symptomatic. And when I started using that, I actually got quite a lot of positive feedback from mm. GPs and uh, and physiotherapists, etc. other people who read this, because it really helps them uh, talk patients down from worry. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. That's something I should consider doing. I'll find the reference and we can put it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Let's, uh, let's wrap things up. So how can people get in contact with us, Frank? Well, we're at Radiopedia on Twitter and on Instagram. And I'm at Frank Gaylard and you are at Dr. Andrew Dixon on Twitter. You can also email us, of course, at podcast at radiopedia.org with all your ideas and feedback. And don't forget, question for next week's episode. Hey, yes, get them in quickly uh, because we record on Thursday nights, don't we, Frank? Yes, and it's uh, important, though, that we don't want general questions and we don't want specific questions like, can you please explain the difference between heterogeneous and heterogeneous? That's Frank's pet hate, number 68, by the way. Uh, yeah, I think you're already up to about five for this podcast <laughs> series so far, and someone's going to keep a list for me somewhere. It's good. But, yes, yeah, so the questions uh, should be something that are uh, you know, relevant to most of our guests, uh, particularly, I think, things about how you work, I think, are particularly interesting. Yeah. A lot of the things that were covered in this panel discussion I really want to get back to because I have strong opinions on many of them. <laughs> uh, and if you want to help support Radiopedia, I'm going to do you a little bit. Then you can become a paid supporter via the website or you can purchase an all-access pass to our online courses uh, and that includes complimentary registration to our annual virtual conference, which is coming up in July from July 24 to 28, Radiopedia 2023. And what else? And you can also help us by leaving a five-star review in the podcast app of your choosing. Ah, uh, good man. You've, you've incorporated that five star in there beautifully. All right. Well, anything else to say before I do the sign off, Frank? I think we're good. Well, it'll be interesting to see whether other people think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll catch you all again sometime soon in the reading room. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.